Far beyond the Seven Seas, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, only a few ruins remain to remind us of the greatest atomic battle of the Cold War. The atom bomb is here. It exists. We must look to the future. This future is still radiating from the Runnet Dome, a landmark of the atomic age. This is like a, a monument to America's big giant fuck up. It was this really bad combination of arrogance and ignorance. 70 years after the atomic tests, traces are still visible everywhere and still etched into the memories of the victims. We were terrified. When the bomb was dropped, the whole sky changed color. Welcome aboard the USS Estes. We'll soon see the largest explosion ever set off on the face of the Earth. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Though these bombs didn't target human beings, they still had far-reaching consequences for society. There's a big problem here with management of government funding. Even today, the people in the Pacific are still suffering. The next generation is deeply affected by the scars of the past and already preparing for the coming catastrophe, climate change. Around 8,000 kilometers east of mainland America, 6,000 from Asia, and over 4,000 kilometers northwest of Australia lies Majuro, the capital city of the Republic of the Marshall Islands. From the main atoll of this group of islands to the Eniwetok Atoll, it is still a long journey. Because of its unique location between the continents, Majuro is a popular destination for round-the-world sailors from all countries of the globe, and also a chance for travelers to hitch a ride. From there, the journey takes us another thousand kilometers across the Pacific, with nothing but open ocean as far as the eye can see. But then, a surprising radio message. We're going to lose about, uh, going back and forth, we're going to lose about uh, eight to ten hours on the sail up to Enewetak. So uh, instead of my arrival, which was planned for, uh, now I was looking at the Saturday afternoon, we're probably going to hit there in the dark by Saturday and have to wait all night to get into the pass. I think altogether we might lose about 24 hours. Obviously, the U.S. Army is still in charge here. Seventy years after the atomic tests, live ammunition is still being fired. Then in the sky they appear. Long-range rockets launched from Vandenberg in California thousands of miles away. These are exercises in shooting down potential nuclear missiles from North Korea. This is still the maritime training camp for Armageddon. Finally, after five days at sea, we arrive in the atomic war zone of yesteryear. The Eniwetok Atoll comprises over 40 islands whose total area is no bigger than that of 10 football fields. The lagoon surrounded by the atoll, however, covers over a thousand square kilometers. Before the atomic tests, more than a thousand people lived here. They were self-sufficient, living only from what the ocean and the fertile land provided. 
and the weather was full big, it was good island because when you grow the coconut and fresh food, it was really good. But after they destroyed the palm and the weather, it changed. The the show is changed and today right now on any weather it's really typical to grow up the coconut and fresh food. So that's the story from my daddy he told me that. It was good. The soil was really good. The final battle for Berlin brought victory over the Allies' enemy Nazi Germany. Japan, however, still refused to admit defeat, and very soon, new battle lines were drawn. Once Germany had surrendered, Harry Truman, Winston Churchill, and Joseph Stalin met at the Potsdam Conference to discuss the new order of Europe. Meanwhile, in the Pacific, the war raged on. The invasion of the 32 Marshall Atolls stands as a masterpiece of amphibious strategy. They are softening blows. This was the first round in a Finnish fight. Although the Marshall Islands, as well as other Pacific islands, had already been captured by American troops in 1944, Japan refused to surrender and attempted to prolong the war she had no chance of winning with kamikaze attacks. Before the direct assault, our tactics were to flank Kwajalein. But the Americans were working on the ultimate weapon, the atom bomb. Robert Oppenheimer and his team were actually hoping to preempt the Germans. But compared to the Americans, Hitler's atomic scientists were still in their nuclear infancy. Fortunately for the Germans, they had already lost the war when the first atomic bombs were set off in the Nevada desert. but the nuclear inferno changed the world. But not in the way the Americans had expected it would. Stalin also wanted the bomb. This meant that the USA were only the leaders in the race, but that had to be demonstrated. The first bomb for wartime deployment was named Little Boy and was dropped over the Japanese city of Hiroshima on August the 6th, 1945. This explosion killed between 20 and 90,000 people outright. Many of the survivors still suffer from the after effects of radiation today. But Japan surrendered. World War II was now finally over on all fronts. Never before had the world seen such an inferno like that in Hiroshima and three days later in Nagasaki. And it made one thing clear, whoever had the bomb had power over the world. Peace had scarcely arrived before a new arms race broke out, and this time it was atomic. Action. The atom bomb is here. It exists. 
we must look to the future. Up until now, only three have been exploded and none over the water. It is the duty of the military services to explore the military might of this new weapon. We want to be prepared for any use of atomic energy that may become necessary, whether offensive or defensive. The end of the Second World War meant that the stage was set for the Cold War to begin. As early as the late 1940s, an unparalleled arms race between the Soviet Union and the USA took off. Ironically, the very people who had never taken part in armed conflict became the first victims of this new confrontation, the inhabitants of the Marshall Islands. And they are still victims today. On the island of Runnet, less than an hour by boat from the main island, Eniwetok, a time bomb is ticking away beneath a gigantic concrete dome. Similar to the Chernobyl sarcophagus or the reactor at Fukushima, the so-called Runnet Dome is a memorial to the excesses of the atomic era. Jack Niedenthal came to the islands to help with development aid as a member of the Peace Corps, a volunteer organization set up by President Kennedy. This is like a, a monument to America's big giant fuck up, that, that giant cement dome. I mean, the first thing that, think, uh, that popped into my mind when I saw it was, this is incredible stupidity. And, and when you, even as a young person, not knowing a lot about science or anything else or history or anything, it just struck me, it was like, how stupid is this? And when you think about, now I've spent all this time, most of my life uh, involved in the nuclear issues out here in the Marshalls, when you think about what happened at the time, to me, it was this really bad combination of arrogance and ignorance. The decision to use the atoll as a testing site was taken directly after the end of World War II. At the time, the atoll was part of the trust territory of the Pacific Islands. The UN ruled that the use of the area for the security interests of the USA was not subject to any restrictions. The United States was the world's only superpower, and in the race for the atomic bomb, America's greatest concern was that espionage could quickly cancel out their technological advantage. Common sense tells you this is dangerous and foolish. You wouldn't risk your neck in a trick like this. Common sense tells us that being shot out of a cannon is dangerous business. Common sense tells you not to be careless at an airfield with propellers and jet engines in action. Handling dynamite. This too looks dangerous, but it's an everyday job to these men because they observe common sense safety precautions. But sometimes we forget that security violations can be dangerous business too. If classified information about this test mission fell into enemy hands, the consequences could be disastrous to all of us, individually and collectively as a nation. Security is only common sense. Don't take chances. Avoid loose talk. Safeguard classified information. Report security violations at once. Prompt action may prevent a minor incident from developing into a serious one. Avoid writing about classified material in letters home. Be sure you're secure. Don't be careless. I hate a careless man. Just in case the Soviets were that vital step ahead, preventive measures were being taken with entertaining information campaigns on the home front. Sundays, holidays, vacation time, we must be ready every day, all the time, to do the right thing if the atomic bomb explodes. Duck and cover. That's the first thing to do. Duck and cover. First, you duck. And then, you cover. You duck and cover tight. Duck and cover under the table. And cover. In April 1948, less than three years after the end of the war, the time had come. 
Operation Sandstone could begin. The first atom bomb, codenamed X-ray, had already attained three times the explosive power of the Hiroshima bomb. The testing then continued in two-week cycles. On May 1st, shortly after 6 a.m., yoke was detonated. The yield had been increased yet again. One thing is clear. These tests not only had a scientific, but also a political purpose, deterrence. That was a show. They had 42,000 men and women up there, 5,000 radiation recording devices, rats, pigs, goats. This was this huge show, and it was just to show the Russians, hey, look what we have. In 1952, Operation Ivy began. This first test of a hydrogen bomb was staged as if it were a feature film. Hollywood film crews took over the directing. All engines ahead one third. All engines ahead one third. Engine room con ahead one third. All engines answer ahead one third. Sir. Engine room reports making turns for four knots, sir. Very well. And we're not really sure of what progress the Russians have made in this business of nuclear research. And so the only safe assumption to make is that they're interested in producing a fission bomb and to use it as some sort of trigger mechanism for a hydrogen bomb. It's obvious we don't want them to have a hydrogen bomb before we do, and so time is urgent. Time is the thing we have to beat. The nuclear devices were becoming increasingly powerful, and after the atom bombs came the hydrogen bombs, each more gigantic than the last, and their effects were studied in meticulous detail. This moment is about 45,000 on the sampler aircraft. F 84 Gs, manned jet fighters, are being used exclusively on this operation. Experience has proven that manned aircraft are just as efficient and much less costly to put in the air than our drones for sample collecting. Jets were selected because they can operate at high altitude. What this tremendous blast did to the atoll, nobody knows. Re-entry parties are leaving the Rendova now by helicopter. It was a military playground for playing with fire, an atomic fire, whose mode of action was often unclear and unpredictable. Coming up on Bogon. The detection station on Bogon appears to be in good shape. No visible sign of plywood tubes. What happened on any way talk, even the weapons that were, even though the weapons there that were not, that were tested were not as powerful as they were on Bikini, a number of their weapons didn't detonate the right way. So what wound up happening is that the really highly radioactive cores didn't get burned off. They just got splattered all over the place. So they went and built the Runet Dome, and that's why it's not supposed to you know, it's going to be thousands of years before it's okay, and they covered it with cement. I mean, that wouldn't be tolerated anywhere else on the planet, but that's what's up on any way to. After 10 years and 44 atomic and hydrogen bombs, the tests were discontinued. What was left behind was an uninhabitable moon landscape, contaminated 
incinerated, abandoned. Today, 70 years later, the remnants of this undeclared war can be seen everywhere. And the future of the island looks just as grim as its past. Meanwhile, there are some 300 people living on the island again, but so far, every attempt to breathe life back into this paradisical landscape has failed. We want to try to bring over the doors. It's a problem, another problem is that the doors can scare because anyone that has got radioactive. It's a problem. But we like invited the tourists to here. But it's a problem that they see anyone that begin me or oh, it's not good safe to stay on the island. So I don't know how we're gonna do it. For the people here, time has stood still. We were terrified. When the bomb was dropped, the whole sky changed color. First there was the giant fireball. Then the sky turned blood red. After that, it turned gray and went very dark. I felt weak. I had pains in my head, in my whole body. Everything was hurting. From a distance, anyway, talk today looks just like it did in the past. Palm-lined beaches, the turquoise sea, idyllic white sand beaches but resettlement, expropriation, and exile have been no less devastating than the bombs. The islanders' sense of community, their self-conception, and their livelihoods have all been blown away. Just like some of their islands. What remains is their faith, this is what unites them and brings them together. They said everybody had to leave the island. We had no choice. They just came with a ship and we were all taken to Ujalang. We didn't even know where we were going. We only found out once we were on the ship. The people here identified with their tiny island, much more than other peoples with plenty of land. Resettlement completely robbed them of their roots and their identity. These people are innocent. They're, they didn't start a war with Germany or Canadian or anything. They, just, they never moved there in video family. They just enjoying their life. And then now here comes the Japanese, here come the German, before the Japanese, here come the... Uh, and then they just move around like they're pets, puppets. Mm -hmm. And now, out of that, it's like, well, what do we do? Mm -hmm. And then some of them, they create a card. What have we done? Why are you punishing us like this? Mm -hmm. You know, it's really... Far away from the blessings of civilization, the life of this small island race was simple but largely carefree. Coconut palms not only provided food, their fibers could be used to make ropes, weave materials, and even make simple tools. The traditional homes were built, raised, and this is the door, and you had to climb into it. And all this is latched uh, roots of the pandanus tree. So hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of yards of the, um, the rope, the uh, senate is called in English. Monbui, and another name is Monkijirik, which means house of rats. And when I ask people why it was called that way, it's because have you, have you ever seen how a rat lives, especially a female rat with her babies? They make very, very cozy houses. So this is the traditional dress or design of the traditional dress for women. And it's made out of pandanus leaf, 
Um, it could be made out of a couple of other fibers. And then um, this is a vine. This brown is made out of a certain vine called adap. And this is the inner uh, bark of a tree, the black. And the outside designs, we've lost the meaning of those. But what they indicated was a woman's land rights or her lineage or her clan. So they were very symbolic, but we don't know what those mm -hmm. symbols mean. And, and in the woman's dress, she wore two knitted. She had one this way and then one this way. In the 1850s, the first missionaries arrived. And in 1906, the islands were colonized as part of German New Guinea. Some of the chiefs became very close to the German people, the mission, well, not the missionaries so much, but the people running the company. And that's one of the reasons why some of the families are so powerful today. Japanese troops conquered the islands in 1914. In early 1944, the Americans prevailed in the battle for the Marshall Islands. After the war, they became a trust territory under U.S. administration. During the atomic bomb tests, there were 11,000 soldiers, technicians, and engineers stationed here. Their barracks are now used as the school and the town hall. In 1979, the Marshall Islands gained independence, but economically, the country is still dependent on financial aid from the USA. What the US did was just horrible. Yet they were out here in this very beautiful place with these, you know, the reason I'm still here after 36 years is these people are really nice. Even my worst enemies, I never want them to leave. I mean, it's, it's just the way people treat you here is a really nice thing. And the idea that they would come here and do that to these kind of people who are very giving and sharing and everything's family and, you know, we're not perfect and there's all kinds of issues here and there, but it's still a very tranquil place. Inuit talk was hit particularly hard in 1952 when the USA tested their first hydrogen bomb. Welcome aboard the USS Estee. As you may or may not know, the Estes here is the command ship of Joint Task Force 132. We have minutes to go before the first blast mic shot of Operation Ivy. Uh, 59 minutes now to be exact. We've been here since daybreak. Left we talked last night during the early morning hours. Now, as you can imagine, feeling is running pretty high about now, and there's reason for it. If everything goes according to plan, we'll soon see the largest explosion ever set off on the face of the Earth. The test islands for Mike are located at the top, or the northern sector, of any Weetok Atoll, some 25 miles from Perry and any Weetok, the two base islands of this atoll proving ground. Everything necessary for the atomic tests was brought in by freight ships and airplanes. Barracks, technical equipment. Buildings for the explosive materials. an entire industrial city in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And then came the moment when for the first time, hellfire was to be ignited. You have a grandstand seat here to one of the most momentous events in the history of science. In less than a minute, you will see the most powerful explosion ever witnessed by human eyes. The blast will come out of the horizon just about there. And this is the significance of the moment. This is the first full-scale test of a hydrogen device. If the reaction goes, we're in the thermonuclear era. For the sake of all of us, and for the sake of our country, 
I know that you join me in wishing this expedition well. It is now 30 seconds to zero time. Put on goggles or turn away. Do not remove goggles or face first until 10 seconds after the first light. Minus 15 seconds. Minus 10 seconds. Niner, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, two. The bomb that was detonated as part of Operation Ivy on October 31st with the harmless sounding name of Mike had an explosive yield equivalent to 10 megatons of TNT, almost 1,000 times more powerful than the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. Some of the islands were simply vaporized by the explosions. What was left apparently seems to have recovered. Tests carried out on fish no longer show increased levels of radiation. Third generation children seem to have no hereditary physical conditions. And the remnants of American military presence are now just part of the scenery. But one thing has changed fundamentally. The people here no longer have the capability to feed themselves by their own efforts. You know, Marshall Island is the way we can make money out of our land is cobra. But we cannot export our cobra from here to where? Japan, Philippines, whatever because somebody stopped us to export the cobra. But they spend our money on with us for support us, bring some more coconut for us to drink. We can drink and eat the cobra, but cannot export the cobra. I don't know why. Foil, and then take it to, to clean up and take it to ruin it. And bury it where mm. all the contamination, most of the contamination, not all of them. Mm. So they did uh, check around here and some of the uh, old rocks are from here they still have mm, uh, radioactive on it. Directly after the weapons tests, radiation on the island was extreme, making it totally uninhabitable. Yet cesium, with a half-life of 30 years, wasn't the major problem. It was rather the fact that unsuccessful tests had released and spread around unknown amounts of the most radioactive substance of all, plutonium. Between 1977 and 1980, three islands were cleaned of residual atomic waste. Large areas of contaminated soil were cleared away and together with the collected debris mixed with Portland cement and filled into a bomb crater.
This crater, the result of the 1958 cactus explosion on the island of Runnit, was 107 meters in diameter and nine meters deep. The highly radioactive waste was then sealed in by 358 concrete slabs, each 46 centimeters thick. The cost of the cleanup amounted to $240 million. But beneath the concrete dome, a time bomb is ticking, and no one knows when it could go off. Worse still, if the sea level rises, it could reach the crater's edge in only a few years and potentially wash it away. Thousands of tons of radioactive waste could then pour into the Pacific. For the USA, however, after the cleanup and the compensation payments, the case was closed. During that negotiation, it started out as 12 million, and we got them all the way up to 75. Half that went into a trust, half was paid out to the people of Bikini, $2.4 million a year over 15 years. It turned out to be like three or $400 a person per quarter. Not, not a great amount of money when you consider what happened. And that, that is still held in trust to this day, and now the payments are about $130 a person per quarter, maybe $500 a year for being away for 70 years and having their lives destroyed, basically, is not that much money. Too little to live and too much to die. The islanders had become little more than beggars. The wife of journalist Gif Johnson, Darlene Keju, fought against this victim mentality. Before we knew it, our islands were blown up. The United States government did not bother to tell us that four of our islands, two in Bikini and two in Anueta, were blown up the face of the earth. When the U.S. Cover, cover officer came from Washington, D.C., he came and see the people of Bikini. He told the chief that the U.S. government were testing the bombs, and I quote, for the good of mankind and to end all world wars. I mean, she just pioneered new ways of promoting health and, and in a community setting. Like, she understood the Western ideas of education and public health, but she also knew how to work with Marshall Islanders. And that combination just proved to be give her a fantastic skill set. We have hundreds of women who have miscarriages. We have leukemia cancers. We have thyroid cancers. We have stillbirth babies. We have nowadays, I just come back from home, and I have talked to many women and men in the population, is that we have babies we call jellyfish babies. A baby is born on a labor table and it moves up and down like this. It's a colorful, ugly thing. It does not shape like a human being. It moves up and down like this on a labor table because that thing is breathing. That is a baby. She said, well, she knew she had grown up on islands that were contaminated by fallout and subsequently released U.S. government documents confirmed that was correct. Um, so her mother had breast cancer. Her father had breast cancer, a very unusual cancer in a male. Uh, and Darlene had not only not one breast cancer, but actually two unique breast cancers, one in each breast, uh, which required multiple surgeries and radiation treatment and so on, and which she did, uh, although she refused to do chemotherapy, uh, which was kind of a last resort for the doctors because she didn't want to sideline herself having to be in Honolulu for a year or whatever going through that kind of treatment. She wanted to be out working in the community and, and doing what she was doing. Darlene Keju Johnson lost her fight against cancer in 1995. She was 45 years old. When the Marshall Islands gained independence, the USA paid $150 million into a trust fund from which all future claims were to be settled. 
a tribunal specially established for the purpose rules on whether claims are justified. The unpaid compensation awards total about $2.3 billion as of now. The fund has been exhausted. Uh, the national parliament continues to provide a small amount of money annually so that this office can remain open for claims to be brought just for the record. But the fact is that very few people come in to make claims because they know that they're going to f take their time to come here to fill out a form and to leave it here, but there's no money to actually be paid. In fact, when the fund was established, the expected annual dividend was put at an estimated 12 percent, a result that even in the best years was never achieved. I think that at some point the U.S. will realize that it did not do, has not done enough to compensate for the damages that the people of the Marshall Islands suffered as a result of that testing. Many different types of damages, exile, exposure, experimentation. Uh, these are all the types of damages, the personal injuries, the cancers, the thyroid conditions that more than 2,000 individuals suffered from and many perished from, uh, died as a result of these cancers. To this day, the Marshall Islands have never recovered, not least due to the constant flow of money from the USA, which still makes up the bulk of the island's revenues. Social self-healing forces within the community have never developed. Besides, corruption has become an everyday occurrence. There's a big problem here with management of government funding. And uh, for, for many years, I'd say for decades, starting out from the, from the 1960s when U.S. aid started to increase here, and what in the early days uh, increase in U.S. aid meant was more government jobs and, and the bureaucracy increased. And essentially, foreign aid, which was then all from the U.S., was seen as a way to, to hire people, and you spread the wealth that way. You hire people and get them in jobs, and they get a little piece of the action. And that's been pretty much how things have gone for so many years. In any we talk, around 1,000 kilometers from the capital, Majuro, doing nothing is also the principal activity of the adult population. Every three months, a supply ship arrives and brings food along with diesel for the power generators. Their food, houses, and electricity are all free for the islanders. For years, contamination meant they couldn't eat the fish from the lagoon. Now, hardly anyone even knows anymore how to catch them. We live, I think, 100% by the uh, food supplement that they're bringing every quarter. Other than that, if we don't have that, we don't, we'll, uh, we'll go on starvation. We have uh, water, which is good, but the, uh, like I said, we don't have that on time, then now the people and the kids are complaining, crying, they're hungry, and we have to, you know, cut the daily uh, uh, food for our family. Yeah. And look over the parties to put like sugar, corn beef, canned corn beef, vegetable, uh, ramen, flour, shortening. Taking powder, try honey, and uh, what else? Anything but a healthy diet. Even the school kitchen only serves white flour, rice, fat, and canned milk. No fruit, no vegetables, no vitamins. Cooking is always a communal effort. involving cans, cans, and more cans. So it's no great surprise that the greatest threat to the islander's health is now diabetes, ironically a disease of affluence. 
While radiation-related illnesses are in sharp decline, the Marshall Islands now lead the world with a 50% rate of diabetes sufferers. Their unhealthy diet also compounded by a genetic predisposition. On top of this, among many peoples in the Pacific, a certain corpulence has traditionally been associated with wealth and high status. She used to come every Monday. Oh, no. for the chicken tender. Yes. When no food to abundant food causes uh, the obesity and diabetes. So this is also another, uh, uh, it looks like because uh, the people were healthy before. For example, uh, India, China, uh, and all those uh, developing countries were surviving with the minimum of what food because of the starvation, because of the famine and all. So the genes know how to manage with the limited. And when the, there is abundant, even in India, it's now becoming the uh, diabetics capital of uh, the world. That's what they are claiming. I mean, another three, four years. So this kind of a high abundant food the agreement regulating U.S. financial payments is due to expire in 2023. If it isn't extended, the next generation will have to fend for themselves. At that point, they'll finally have no choice but to throw off their shackles of victimhood and step back into the real world. I know it's dangerous to live here, but the uh, the freedom, like I say, you compare, you weigh freedom and the danger, you know. Is it dangerous to go to Iraq? It's dangerous, but it is the freedom that American is enjoying right now. Somebody has to do it. Is it the freedom to go to a uh, war? You like that, no? But somebody has to do it so you can have, you know, freedom. It's all about at the end of the day. It's all about Myself, I believe in spend my all my time in life in Anuasa. Even we know it's radioactive, but I love my island. I like to stay. Whether the third generation has the slightest chance of a successful new beginning also depends on rising sea levels. Experts are divided on the speed at which this will happen. It's quite possible that in a few decades' time, the Runit Dome will be the last visible sign of what was once paradise. Mm -hmm.